Hey there, and welcome to episode number 148, where I chat with Amy Wheeler about compassionate and inclusive leadership. And we talk particularly about the yoga community and the importance of embracing equality, inclusion, and diversity in that community. So please stay tuned. Hello and welcome to the Elements of Ayurveda podcast. I'm your host, Colette, and I hope to educate and empower you to take charge of your health and well-being, preventing disease in the body and mind so that you can thrive in life. I will be sharing the holistic teachings of Ayurveda, the ancient healing tradition from India. I will also discuss topics like yoga, which is the sister science of Ayurveda, health and wellness, nutrition, fitness, and mindfulness practices, as well as interviewing lots of inspiring people along the way. My humble wish is to help you to connect to your true nature, to mother nature, and to help you to connect to each other. If you're new to Ayurveda, I recommend that you start by listening to the first couple of episodes where I do an introduction to Ayurveda and the mind-body types. Now, if you like the content, please subscribe to the show so the new episodes will automatically download for you to enjoy. I've also set up a Facebook group for us to connect and to support each other, and I'd love for you to join me over at the Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. And now, here's the show. Hello and welcome back to Elements of Ayurveda. Today I have the lovely Amy Wheeler, who's going to talk to us about compassionate leadership. Now, Amy's a regular guest on the podcast, but I want to remind you of Amy's leadership experience. Amy has been a university professor for the past 25 years and recently finished her tenure as the president of the board of IAYT, which is the International Association of Yoga Therapists. So Amy, welcome back to the show. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion today. Thank you so much for having me. I feel like this is such a critical topic at this moment in time. Yes, such a critical topic. So I'm going to allow you to lead the way because I know you have a lot to share with us and I'm really interested in what you have to tell us today. Thank you. You know, when we decided on this topic, um, I couldn't help but think about the Bhagavad Gita one of our main yoga texts and, and how it really lays out for us how to be a compassionate leader. I mean, this is the essence of what Arjuna has to do in this great epic war. And so the first thing that comes to mind is that when people read the Bhagavad Gita that aren't brought up with it, that aren't, you know, super familiar with it, they're like, how can a yogi be at war? How can a yogi be killing people? That seems against, you know, the concept of our first yama, ahimsa, mm-hmm. which is nonviolence. And and I think people take this story as a very literal story. So the first thing I want to say is this is not a literal story. Um, it is about the battle that we have within ourselves and that to be a compassionate leader, you and I will constantly have to work on the battle within and and really get a lot of clarity, uh, a lot of connection to our deeper self, compassion for those who we are working with, as well as self-compassion, that this story of the Bhagavad Gita is all about you doing the work on you. Mm. And the war that we're talking about as it pertains to leadership in this instance, is the the war of what should I do? How do I have clarity? What direction do I go? You know, how do I know this is the right decision kind of thing? And that if we can spend the time doing the internal work, we will be able to put ourselves out into the world in a way that it honestly doesn't matter what the external reaction to us is, which I know seems like a big statement, but that when we're authentic and true to ourselves and our values, 
it's really none of our business what the world thinks of that. Absolutely. So what do you think of that? I mean, it's kind of a radical statement to say you're leading people, but it's nobody's business what they think of you. Yeah, I think if you have done your inner work, if you are truly connected to your true nature, if you are truly standing in your truth, if it's not from a place of ego, if it's from a place of compassion and empathy for others and for the betterment of others, and even though you may be going against the grain or the current belief system, but if you know that in the long run, your beliefs or your leadership role and what you're trying to do is going to be of betterment for everybody and you see the bigger picture of things. And I think that clarity of seeing the bigger picture of things and that awareness comes from doing your own inner work, comes from the cleansing and the mindfulness practices and making sure you're in alignment with the circadian rhythms and your doshas are pacified. But with that clarity comes the awareness, seeing the bigger picture of things and understanding that your leadership is not just for you right now in this place. It's for, hopefully it will continue down the line and for be for the betterment of others later in life. It's like that saying, I can't think of it now, but planting a tree now so that others in generations will enjoy the shade of that tree. So you may not benefit from your leadership style right now. In fact, you may be in the fire because people are not understanding your leadership choices, but you know down the line that it's going to be for the betterment of everybody and people are going to uh, benefit and be rewarded from the changes you're making now. So I think when it's, when the leader is looking at it, not from a place of ego, but from a bigger picture and encompassing all people, I think then the person again, will maybe going against the grain, but has to stand in their truth and has to a lot of times feel the fire because people sometimes are short-sighted and they don't see the bigger picture. Exactly. And, And even with this goal of serving humanity and doing the most good for the most people, I think there's also an element of humility because Mm. We may think we're doing the right thing. I mean, I've been on leadership teams where myself and another person have been at great odds about what is the best direction forward. And we both think that we're doing the best thing for humanity and for the future and for the stability of the organization. So, you know, it gets interesting. And I think having humility and Ishvara Pranidhana, where you just do your best and let the outcome be what it's going to be, because we don't know all the factors that are going to come in and shift and change. Right. With that said, the best we can do is is be true to ourselves, be authentic to ourselves, go deeply inward, ask the hard questions, be honest, stay in balance as much as possible, talk to smart people and people that we value and their opinions. And then with humility, make the best choices moving forward. Right, exactly. And it's true what you say. Most people think they're right from their own point of view. But we also have to make sure that we remain curious and objective. And if you're at odds with someone greatly, just being curious about where are they coming from that I'm not seeing? What is it that they're seeing that I'm not seeing? And trying to get to know their view of this situation of this leadership and seeing where they're coming from. And maybe that there is something to learn. And like you said, having humility, or maybe that, you know, you could teach them something that they are not seeing. So it does require a real uh, lack of the ego, humility, curiosity, and being objective. You're making such a great point for kind of a a democratic way of leadership where we value our people that we work with. We hired the best, so we we know that they have great ideas and we listen to them. It's not a top-down model. It's an interaction model. And then we take all of the information that we've been given by our really smart team and, and take it all into consideration and then make a decision. And I think finish the loop by going back to them and say, look, I considered this perspective, that perspective, so-and-so believes this, you think this, taking it all into consideration as your leader 
please, you know, trust in me. I would like to move forward in this direction and, and get their buy-in. Yes, exactly. I think that's a great process. And then it's very important to remember not to take it personally. You can't have your own personal, of course, your feelings are going to come into decisions, but there has to be a boundary there. Right. And here's another thing I was thinking as I was preparing for this podcast. Uh, Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita, he was born into a family of warriors. He had been trained since a young boy to be a warrior should there come a war. And all of his prana was prepared for decades to put him in this position to do what's right in this moment. And I think we need to take into consideration as leaders, our personal constitution, uh, you know, Ayurvedically, what our gifts are, what our challenges are, what our life experience has taught us, uh, how, how our prana has been trained in a particular direction, and basically do what's right for me at this moment in time with this organization. And if you put a different person in leadership, they may make completely different uh, dis- you know, decisions because all of the things I listed are different. So part of what I have come to understand is that when I decide to be in a leadership position, I want to make sure that that organization actually wants what I bring to the table Mm. because there's nothing more miserable than coming in with my excitement and passion and drive and, you know, ambition to change the world and change yoga and yoga therapy and then have it be met with, oh no, we don't want that. (laughs) So the match between the leader and the organization with everyone on the same page is really critical, I think. It is indeed. And also that if it's an area where leadership is changing regularly, is that the other people involved are open and willing for the new person to step in and bring with them their values and their passions and their skill set and to be open for change. And that's where everyone needs to be on the same page in regards okay, we, you know, we're moving forward now and with new leadership. And so we need to embrace this. We need to let this person bring their values to the table and see what changes and fresh perspective this person can bring. But it does take a, an openness and humility from others involved. I completely agree. There is nothing worse than bringing someone new in Mm. and then keeping all the old people there to look over their shoulder and to, you know, I don't know if bully is the right word, but, you know, my dad taught me long time ago that, you know, he was a, a Lutheran minister and he might serve a congregation for 17, 18 years. And the moment that he passed the torch, he did not stay in that community. Even though these people knew him and loved him and trusted him and he was part of their family and he spent every holiday with them for 18 years, he would remove himself and find a new church, a new community, Mm. so that the new person could have space to spread their wings. And I fully believe that that is what needs to happen. You cannot stay and look over the new person's shoulder. It's, it's just not okay. No, it's not. And I think a lot of people are scared of change. And again, that comes down to a person's, you know, characteristics, but a lot of people are fearful of change. And unfortunately that shows up in ways that are really putting the new person in the new leadership role on edge. And it's such an energy drain if you're constantly fighting th- that energy day in, day out of these people who are just don't want change. But how lovely was it for that your dad to realize that and to move on and understand that he needs to give space to the new person to come in and, and start their adventure. And, you know, of course, the people in the congregation would still call him and say, please come to my funeral or my wedding or my baptism. And, and occasionally he would if it was a very close relationship. But he basically told them, look, this is not appropriate. I need to let this new person get their feet on the ground and lead you in a new direction that is consistent with their values. You hired this person, so you must trust that they 
are what you need going forward. Right, exactly. And and it has to be said too, that it has to be on both sides of the fence that the person coming in needs to respect that there may be a set administration in place and that they need to work with them as well. So there yeah. is a, a a big balancing act there between being, you know, really excited about a new position and coming into a new role, but at the same time, respecting that people have been there for a long time. And, you know, it's going to take a lot of communication and compassion to work with these people and to get them used to the new way of doing things. Right. And that goes back to hiring someone who has the values that the current administration right. wants. It's right. a match, right? Exactly. And nobody's wrong. It's just about a good match. Exactly. So, you know, when I go back to the Bhagavad Gita and I, I look at this war that Arjuna is having within about his dharma and the fact that he has tried everything to get along with his cousins. The story goes, there is a hundred... Um, a hundred cousins, the Kauravas, that are not behaving well, they are indecent, they are, you know, taking everything, they're not allowing the, the five brothers, Arjuna and his four brothers, to, to live comfortably. They, they push them out into the forest for 12 years at a time, they cheat, they steal. And at some point, you know, after being in the forest for 12 years, isolated, the Pandavas come back and they're like, look, we have tried to get along. We have tried to work with you, cousins. We love you. You are family. But we're not going to go back into the forest for another 12 years. This is just not okay. And and they really, really tried to be conciliatory and find you know, a way to meet everybody's needs. And the cousins, the 100 cousins just wouldn't have it. Mm. And so this puts Arjuna and his brothers in a very strange position because there's five of them, and then they have the chariot driver, Krishna, which is, of course, the divine, against a hundred, and they're standing on the battle lines trying to decide, like, okay, are we going to go to battle, even though there's only five of us? Uh, Are we going to get slaughtered? Are we going to... um, You know, should we even be having a battle in the first place? We love these people that are on the other side. Their their martial arts teachers are over there. Their uncles are over there. Um, And so that battle of, am I going to do what I feel is right, what is fair, what is, you know, involving justice, even though I may get slaughtered, right? right? Yeah. That That's really a hard thing. And I, I was talking to a, a friend named Janessa yesterday, and I said, you know, when I'm standing on that line, hoping to be a leader in the yoga world, my legs are weak. I have, uh, you know, dorsal vagal, <laughs> okay. where I literally can't feel my legs and they're wow. shaking and, and I can't breathe. And I, I feel like, whoa, I don't really want to do this. But on the other hand, there's no choice. This is what Arjuna had, that there was no choice. They they can't continue to be treated badly. And so, you know, my thing with, with leadership in the yoga world right now is if we are truly yogic, we do need to wake up to social justice. We do need to have more equity and inclusion and diversity. Mm-hmm. We do need to look at our unconscious biases. We do need to have more training and cultural competency. And when I say those things to the old guard who's had a lot of power for 40 years, they don't get it. They don't want it. Wow. They think they think I'm a troublemaker. They call me a pain in the ass. Mm. <laughs> and my legs shake and I go into dorsal <laughs> vagal and I can't wow. breathe and I sweat and I lose sleep and I shake and I tremble. All the things that Arjuna had when he was faced with living out his dharma that he had prepared his prana for, but was like, I'm not sure I want to do this. <laughs> right. So I, this is what we have to do. We have to really go within and, and feel that trembling and do it anyway. Wow. I'm so surprised though. I thought that would be within the values of the yoga community. 
Can you tell us a little bit more about what you were suggesting? I think it's, you know, Janessa had some great words for it yesterday. She said there's a great white silence where when mm. studio owners or organizations are not getting on board with DEI, where they're dragging their feet, where they're saying, oh, it will happen one day, or where they're using tokenism and pretending that they're getting on board, but really they're not. You know, there's a lot of transition happening in the yoga world from the top to the bottom. Right. And know? getting on board with DEI? Yeah. Getting on board with diversity, equity, inclusion, social okay. justice. Okay. There, are, you know, whether we like it or not, the yoga world has been run by white people. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> you know, middle class, to upper class white people. Yeah. And we've excluded a lot of people, including, you know, South Asians and, and people of color and indigenous people. And, and so this transition that's happening is rough. Mm -hmm. And we're having white fragility. We're having white silence where we basically cover up for people and don't say anything. We stay neutral, right? And, and I'd like to think that the whole yoga world is on board, but they're not, Colette. They are that's so amazing not. to me. You didn't, Isn't you don't see that? No, I'm not in any of those Facebook groups. I stay oh, away from I, that. I just do my own yoga. <laughs> yeah, I guess, you know, I'm, I'm smack dab in the middle of it. I'm right. Well, you were very much involved all day, every day. Mm -hmm. And, and I don't think people have evil intentions. I really don't. I think every person, myself included, has a good heart. We are working towards something better for the yoga world as well as the world at large. But we just have very different strategies, very different ways of doing that, different language that we want to use, different perceptions of how fast or slow it should go. Um, a, a lot of us don't, because we've been in a place of privilege, we don't have empathy for the other. Mm. We don't understand the experience of walking into an all white yoga studio and being the only person of color there and either being completely ignored or having everyone come up and accommodate you so much that it's just awkward and uncomfortable and right. you feel like the only thing they're seeing is is the color of your skin and not the wholeness of who you are right mm -hmm. so it's just a really big time in the yoga world of sorting out who are we How do we want to be? How can we get our communities up to speed in terms of perception, language, ideology? And we're not all on the same page. We're clearly not on the same page. So what do you see as, you know, a paramount importance that needs to change? I think in general, the problem I see is that when things are good for me and my friends and my students, we don't realize how much the others, if you, you know, if there is such a thing, mm -hmm. um, the others are suffering and we've been blind. And so the biggest thing that needs to happen is empathy, is compassion, is a realization of what people have been feeling for decades, excluded, not valued, their voices not being heard, not belonging, um, not included in the conversation, right? And so the biggest thing that is shifting, and I'm so happy it's shifting, but needs to continue and we have to keep beating this drum, is that the people who have had privilege, myself included, get empathetic and compassionate to those who've not had privilege. And one thing I want to say, this is not just a racial issue, There are many, many people that have different types of privilege. And I would argue that all of us have some type of privilege. And I talked to one of my South Asian friends about this, that she's not had privilege with the color of her skin, but her family and most of her friends' families have been very, very wealthy. And they've had a large amount of privilege because of their wealth, right? So mm. I just want to point this out that this is not, only white people are privileged and everybody else isn't privileged. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about everyone recognizing where they've had privilege and then trying to get into the shoes of the other, doing in yoga what we call pratipaksha bhavana, taking the opposite perspective and saying, wow, what must it be like to be 
this person or that person? How must they feel? How, what ways have we unconsciously or consciously excluded them? Right. And, and doing that really deep inner work as Svadhyaya or self analysis, self reflection. Mm. So that, that's what needs to happen. And that's what we're really struggling with as a community, I think. I'm going to jump in here real quick to tell you about my upcoming discounted group digestive reset cleanse. This is the cleanse I host at the joint of the seasons. And this cleanse starts September 18th. Now, even though it's a group cleanse, you still receive a 90 minute online consult with me where I will determine if you have a current imbalance and then I will tailor the recipes, the yoga, the breath practices, the meditation, and anything else I think you need to bring your body and mind into balance. You get access to a private web page where there's lots of educational videos. Now, the importance of cleansing during the transition of the seasons is because there may be an accumulation of toxins from the previous season. And also as the climate changes, as the weather and the temperature changes, as we enter into a new season, there can be a lot of confusion in the digestive system. And this can result in illnesses. It can result in the sniffles, colds, allergies, flus, and of course, our digestive health is directly related to the strength of our immune system. I talked about this in detail in my previous podcast episode, which was number 147, Boosting Your Immunity. So if you want to hear more about that correlation between gut health and the strength of our immunity, please check that out. And of course, we all really want to take care and nurture our immune system right now, given the current COVID situation. So if you're interested in joining this group Digestive Reset Cleanse, please check out the link in the show notes or just visit my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com. Go to the events tab and there you'll find all the details on this cleanse starting September 18th. I advise you to book soon because there's only a certain number of 90 minute consults available before we start the cleanse. Now, if that date of September 18th doesn't suit your schedule, check out the private cleanse where you get to choose your own dates and you'll find that under the services tab on my website. Just go to programs there. Okay. So please check that out. I'd love to have you along and we'll take care of your digestive health and your immunity with this digestive reset cleanse. Okay. Let's get back to the show. It's so much more than just who's attending classes. It's who's teaching classes. It's Mm -hmm. who's at the front desk. It's Mm -hmm. who is in charge of the finances of the organization, who's in charge of the mission statement, who's in charge of the marketing and advertising, right? That on so many layers, we need a cultural competency shift. And I think that's really hard because almost every studio owner I know is a a middle-aged, you know, middle to upper class white person, Yeah. right? And and the, the fact is, and this is the same in my organization, I do everything. I answer every email. I do every Facebook ad. I do every, I, I've taught every single hour for the last three years because I didn't have enough money coming in to pay a bunch of teachers. I mean, it's, it's very interesting. You know, someone might say, well, why aren't you hiring XYZ people? And I, I think, well, I'm not hiring anybody. Right. So yeah. I can see, I have compassion for how this happens and why it happens. But all the more reason that we as studio owners or school owners need to get up to speed with cultural competency and start interacting with people and learning and reading and watching, you know, YouTube and interviewing and podcasting and getting ourselves up to speed then, especially if we can't really afford to hire a big staff that can get us up to speed. Right. But it is a cultural thing. It really yeah. is stems from the culture. Yes. Which is tough to change. It is, but I, I have hope. And I'm really- not just talking about yoga culture. I'm talking about, like, if we were talking about the U.S., the culture in the U.S., you know, when I think when I went to Boston first in the 90s, it was everything is very segregated. You know, you have your Irish section, your Italian section, the Chinese section, everything was very segregated. Um, and that's part of the culture. It is. 
it's the the culture of the other. Yeah, which really shocked I, I, me I'm, when I went to the U.S. I couldn't understand it. I know, and and in fact, in the last two and a half three years, it's gotten even worse. I mean, I, I could say it's gotten worse, but then I could also say it's just come out of the shadows. And some of us who were really unaware of how bad it is are now aware. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so I think the yoga industry, what I call the yoga industrial complex, is just a mirror of the greater cultural it is. context. Yes. And, and so, you know, going back to the Bhagavad Gita, mm-hmm. you know, when, when Arjuna is standing on the side of the battlefield uh, with Krishna and Krishna is telling him, all right, have at it, let's do this. Arjuna looks across the battlefield and sees every single person he cares about. And he's so depressed. He's, he has a huge emotional reaction and his, mm. he's filled with compassion and empathy for the people that he's going to battle with. His limbs get heavy. His mouth gets dry. His body is trembling. The hairs are standing up on the back of his neck. His skin is burning. He he falls down in, in his hands. He's not able to stand up. His mind is going all over the place. And he just starts seeing all the destruction that's going to happen if he stands up for what's right. Right. And and that's how I feel. I, I don't hate anybody. I don't want to be enemies. I don't want to go to war with anybody. But I also need to hold what I consider the, the candle, the light, and say, all right, we have to go in a new direction. We have to actively work on this. It's not going to resolve itself. And I don't want to talk about 2021 when we have enough money. I want to know what are we doing today? Mm. Today, what are we doing today? Right. With what we have, the resources we have, the faith that we have, the determination we have, Let's do this now and continue doing it. So I think that's that's really the challenge. And, you know, I think a lot of people fear that the George Floyd murder has, has now settled down and people are distracted by COVID and the economy is crashing. And people are worried like, oh, this is going to get put on the back burner yet again. Mm. And so when I stand up and my legs are trembling as I give these podcasts and and continue this conversation, I feel like Arjuna and I feel, you know, with humility, like I'm being called to fulfill my Dharma in this way, even though it's probably upsetting to people. They may not like me. They may say bad things about me. They say, you know, I'm hard to work with or don't, you know, don't do work with her. I still have to do it. I still, and I have to have compassion for those people who are saying those things about me at the same time, which is really hard because yeah. I have a little temper when it comes to that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, sister. But I don't understand why they're so against what you're saying. What you're saying is very logical. It's about inclusion. So I don't understand yeah. how somebody would have the audacity to even come back and say, you know, you're making the wrong changes. You have the wrong viewpoint. Isn't this what we all want? So I'll just give you a few of the responses. Um, one of them yesterday when I was doing a Facebook Live was something to the effect of, oh, you people, you're getting so militant or you're so um, you're so woke or you're up on your high horse or, you know, just really kind of nasty things like that when you're fighting for social justice and and people are actually putting you down for that. Yeah. Um, another, another common one is, and, and this one, I'm, I, I ha- hate to even say it out loud, but it must be said, well, if we have more diversity and equity and inclusion, the quality is going to go down. We're just going to hire people based on the color of their skin and not mm-hmm. their actual, actual skill set. And, and we can't have the quality go down, which as I said, I, I don't even like to say that one out loud, but I've, I've heard that quite a bit and fought against it. Wow. Want more? Oh, yeah, go ahead. (laughs) Let's bring them to the light. (laughs) Yes, Mm -hmm. let's bring the candle into the dark room. Mm -hmm. Another one is there's not enough people out there for these high-level positions with the qualifications and the experience to work at this level. So we're going to have to build somebody up from from the ground up over time and and basically mentor them, which is total BS. Yeah, how, plenty- and how do they know if they haven't looked? 
or that they don't even have the circles or the connection right, right. to connect with p- highly qualified candidates that may not look or speak or think exactly like us. Uh, right. You know? So how much do you think that the competitive culture is coming into this? Do you think this is competitive in a way, you know, um, the American culture can be very competitive. And do you think that the, it's a, it's a competition thing as well? We want to protect our, our ground as it were. So here's my theory on it. And mm-hmm. Anybody can disagree with me. It's just a hypothesis. And I oftentimes don't even believe my own thoughts. So I feel like the, the U S in general, as well as the yoga world in the U S has first and second chakra issues around greed and safety and security and, and that that's what's driving this because there's no reason to have me versus the other. If you feel safe and secure, there's no reason to fight about who's making all the money in yoga, which is a total joke because as far as I know, none of us are making money. Even the big corporations are, (laughs) they don't make money. Right. You know, for most of us, this is just, um, even though we may look like we have big, beautiful organizations, we're doing this out of SEVA mainly. I mean, I keep a full-time job so that I can do this in my, in, you know, as my dharma. I don't have a lot of money in the bank. I'm Mm -hmm. very transparent about that. So I think somehow in people's minds, they're thinking, oh, these people are making all the money off yoga, which is a safety and security issue. And I, I should get my hands on some of that. And then, you know, so I, that's what I think it is. I I think competitiveness is more third chakra. Like, am I worthy? Am I good enough? Am I better than you? Are you better than me? To me, there may be some of that, but I think it's that the primal cause is first and second chakra. I totally agree. Absolutely. So we've got a couple more chapters to the story and I know we're on a timeline this morning. So Arjuna is standing there doubting himself. He's saying, am I the person to do this? Is this right action? Could somebody else do this? Is there some other strategy? Is there some other way around this? And he's just having an 18 chapter discussion about his doubts, right? Mm -hmm. And, And I think that's what a lot of us do. I know I lie in bed at night having doubts like, am I, am I being militant? Am I being unreasonable? Am I hard to work with? Am I um, a person that everybody's going to talk behind their back and say, Oh, you don't want to be with her. Right. Like, I think that's a natural human emotion and and I have to soothe myself and turn on my vagal nerve and Mm. calm myself down and get my legs under me and do self care so that I can come back the next day and say, I need to do this work for future generations Mm -hmm. because if me and people like me don't do it, our ancestors will suffer and society will continue to break down Mm -hmm. and I must surrender myself. I must be one of those five against the hundred and, and go up for slaughter if Mm -hmm. need be Mm -hmm. that it's bigger than me. Right. Absolutely. And you're shining the light on a topic that really needs to be unveiled. And also you're going against the, these people who have been in, power for decades and have liked their cushy number and are not comfortable with all this change and that you're suggesting, but it's also what needs to happen for us to move into the world that we want to be in. Cause right now things are, are falling down because it's not inclusive for everybody. Our world is not working for everybody and we won't have happiness. We won't have good vibrational energy vibes if everyone is not succeeding in life. And there's no reason for us to be competitive with each other. There's enough out there for everybody. And in fact, if we encourage people to be in tune with their true nature and to use their skill sets, we will all thrive from that. Absolutely. It, it is our dharma. It is mm. our purpose. And what Arjuna is saying is, and what he comes to finally, is there's no other choice. And if that mm-hmm. means that I get kicked out of yoga, or my school goes defunct, because somebody thinks I am a militant person about it, like, I've told my husband, that's okay. Mm-hmm. It's all right. I, I can go do something else. If if this 
gig doesn't work out, but it doesn't change that I need to do right action for me at this moment in time. Right. And you have to stand in your truth. You have this burning inside of you and you have to let it out. Maybe you will be kicked out. I don't know. But then down the line, like a lot of people who are kicked out of things, it could be a long time later, but then it comes to light that, oh my goodness, we now understand why this person was taking that action. Absolutely. I've had that. I, I guess I'm a a pioneer in a lot of things because mm-hmm. I have had that happen so many times where I become, you know, the outlaw. And then literally two, three, four, five years later, they right. come back and they're like, oh my gosh, thank you. You were the troublemaker, but we just didn't see it. And, you know, it's just kind of funny how it just seems to be my karma. <laughs> no, absolutely. I look at Colin Kaepernick when he took oh, the knee. Love him. Right. And he took the knee and he took heat. He lost his job for that. And now look at everybody. You know, then during the protests, you had cops taking the knee. Everybody is now looking back to Colin Kaepernick like he tried to warn us about police brutality. He started in 2017. He's had to wait three years with no job. Wow. And, you know, he's a professional athlete and he lost his career, not because he wasn't a great quarterback. But because they didn't like him saying his truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's really important for us to speak our truth. And, you know, again, from a place of compassion and empathy, but also if it's something that's really burning inside of you to speak it, because we know that if we don't speak our truth, then it's going to affect us physically, mentally, it's going to affect us. So I think we have to make sure that we're in balance, make sure that we have good foundation structures. And I'm talking about Dinacharya, I'm talking about yoga practices, I'm talking about eating well, pacifying your doshas, make sure you have clarity and mentally so that you can stand in your truth with passion, with fire, and feel very much aligned with what you're saying. And And also knowing that we each play a unique role. I might be the person who had a leadership position and therefore someone perceives I have some power, which is funny to me, but Mm -hmm. let's say that I do. Um, Well, maybe my role is to come on podcasts like this and speak. Another person's role is to be a storyteller around the campfire. Another Mm -hmm. person's role is to be a mother who raises her children in a way that has diversity and inclusion and equity, right? That Mm -hmm. we don't all have to do the same thing, but each of us has some small role to play. And within our power, we do what we can to move, you know, move forward just a little bit. Right, right. And until we all realize that we are one world community, we are on this earth We are one family on this earth and we have to work together. You know, it's ridiculous when you look at the earth from space and you're looking at this small planet in the solar system and we're down here fighting and killing each other and burning things up and, you know, fighting over silly things. It's just ridiculous. And how much we could achieve if we all just have the understanding that we are all connected and until our brothers and sisters are all thriving, we will not thrive. And the earth is fighting back now. The earth is telling us, Mother Nature is telling us that the path you're going on is wrong. And we know that in order for us to get into a greater consciousness, to enter into this new world that we want, we all have to understand that we're all connected. And if you're taking from somebody else to enrich yourself, it's not going to be a good outcome for you. Absolutely. And, you know, I saw this picture of of some of the protests that were going on and you know people were bloodied and you know had just been completely abused Mm. and yet they were carrying their abusers on their backs to to get the abuser out of the situation so the abuser wouldn't get beaten up like I, i don't know that on some level that doesn't sit well with me like i'm like wait a minute yet again the abused has to do the right thing and the abuser gets carried out on the shoulders. But right. another part of me is like, hey, this is this is the only way forward. It is. And it reminds me of, sorry to interrupt. Oh, just saying, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. We, together is the only way forward. 
Yeah, and it reminds me of Michelle Obama's famous saying, when they go low, we go high. And, you know, sometimes people are fighting back. Well, we know we have to meet fire with fire, but then you're devaluing yourself and you're going lower. And when you see those low tactics, when you see people who are not um, in their truth and who are, you know, maybe saying hateful things or not being compassionate, you really have to stay high, as Michelle Obama says, that you really have to be um, above it all and not get caught up in that lower vibration and stay above. And this is where you really, like we're talking about earlier, really need to make sure your foundations are strong. Absolutely. I completely agree. And staying focused on the goal. I mean, I can get pretty distracted by the, you know, the things that happen behind the scenes and forget what am I doing here? Mm -hmm. So, you know, staying focused. Goal. And say focus on the goal. Exactly. And sister, you were born on, remind me again, the Women's March. <laughs> yes, I was born on Women's Liberation Day. You were born with a fire, girl. All the women took their bras off and put them in the garbage cans and burned them August 26, 1970. I mean, and my parents laughed. They're like, oh, because my parents are civil rights activists. And, and they're like, wow, she was born on Women's Liberation Day. Yeah. Interesting. So this is your destiny. You were born in that fire. Yep. <laughs> <sighs> Gonna yeah. need a lot of vagal toning. <laughs> yeah, the planets must have been on fire that day, you know, and, and you took on that energy. Think so, and it was like at five o'clock in the morning. So at sunrise, oh, right. she arrives to come and Ta-da! fulfill her dharma, <laughs> her, well, her own small little tiny dharma. Watch out, world! No, it's a big dharma. You're having a big effect, and you're shaking up a lot of things. And when you shake up these old systems, the fire comes at you, and you are. I know you are strong enough to stand there in it and hold your own. And um, it's not easy. And I admire the work you're doing. I'm glad that we were able to bring this to light in the podcast today. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Because I'm, like I said, I'm not in that community these days. So I had no idea. So thank you for sharing with us. I'm just so grateful for the platform you provide for so many of us to come and speak about climate change and about justice and about self-care and compassion and all the important things in life. I mean, your podcast is it's just like this culmination of what's important in life. So thank you for providing us with a platform to speak. Oh, it's my pleasure. And this is important. This is important for our health and well-being. Again, if we're not all thriving, then we are suffering. Yes. You know, and, and we have to learn that, that we all have to thrive in this world and there's enough for all of us and there's no need for the greed and the competition. So maybe leave you with some thoughts today about thinking about your community, thinking about making sure that others are thriving, that others are included and what changes can you make to be inclusive? 100%. We all just do our little part. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, my dear. Your work is amazing in the world. And thank you for shining light on this topic and sharing with us today. Thank you. Until next time, go out there and make some fireworks. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good. (laughs) You fire starter. (laughs) (laughs) Take care, my dear. Thank you. Bye for now. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Amy. It was so courageous of her to come on the podcast and shine light on this very important topic. If you think that friends or family may be interested in this episode, please share it with them so we can get this information out there. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast. And also want to ask you, have you rated and reviewed the podcast? If you haven't, I would appreciate you doing so wherever you listen to your podcasts. I'm also going to link in the show notes to the episode Boosting Your Immunity, which was number 147, where I talked about the importance of your gut health in relation to your immunity. And don't forget, I have that seasonal digestive reset cleanse coming up September 18th. If you're interested, get in touch. You'll get the link in the show notes 
or go to my website, elementshealingandwellbeing.com. Just go to the events tab and you'll find the group discounted digestive reset cleanse there. Also, if you want to support the podcast, you can do so over on my Patreon page. You'll find that link on the podcast page of the website, also in the show notes. And finally, if you want to comment on this episode, please do so over on the Facebook group, the private Facebook group. I'll put that link in the show notes. It's called the Elements of Ayurveda podcast group. Thanks so much for tuning in. Take good care of yourself. And until next time, slong go full. Bye for now.